Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the third Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 15th, 2024. Our first reading will be from Zephaniah, chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. The alternative of the psalm, which we read during this season, will be Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 2 through 6. Our second reading is Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And our gospel this week is the third chapter of Luke, reading verses 7 through 18. And so, as you told us was coming, Matt, here we are. Here's John. Yeah, Matthew and John and uh, and Luke both give us some extended preaching from John. Mm-hmm. I guess John's gospel gives us some extended teaching from John. But here and but then Luke gives us this paragraph, verses ten through fourteen, where he addresses the crowds who are like, "Okay, what are we supposed to do now?" And then John's like, "Well, just don't be jerks, right?" I mean, it's it's it's, it's pretty simple. simple. And then he talks to tax collectors and the soldiers as well, but. The you know and I don't mean to discount what happens in the first and the third paragraphs, but uh, don't miss the fact that that only John that only Luke gives us that middle one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and as we talked about last week, this is a continuation of of chapter three, which is essentially a, a long introduction to who Jesus is and what yeah. Jesus will do, in part by. Uh, in part by John the Baptist. We'll get the baptism of Jesus in 21 through 22. Uh, And then you have, of course, the genealogy of, uh, according to Luke. And this is all before Jesus says a thing. (laughs) And so I, I, that's before, before Jesus even, even says anything uh, or even comes on, you know, really comes on the public scene, right? You have uh, you have all of these words of of John, and so how are we hearing? How are we hearing? As I mentioned last week, who Jesus is, how Jesus is being introduced. Um, what are the different ways in which our titles, things Jesus will do that uh, that a preacher could enter into? But then, as you said, Matt, then well, then what shall we do? Um, what's, what is going to be our, our response to this? And I alluded to that last week too, that, uh, that, that Advent is not just about this passive waiting, but to say, okay, now, now what, what, what difference is this going to, uh, uh, what difference is this going to me- mean for, uh, for my character, for my behavior, um, for how I am in the world? In light of the past activities of what God has done, we have confidence in the promises of what God is going to do. And with the expectation of those promises being realized, how do we act? What do we do? This is a a text where um, that question that is asked, how do you guys realize you need to be fleeing from the wrath to come? You know, that, 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 that question gets, who told you? I mean, of all people, you. But very quickly, John's comments will shift and says, then this is what you do. Bear fruit. Make it evident. Make righteousness evident in the things that you do. And they receive this word. You know, this this begins off as this could be adversarial. Maybe it should be adversarial, but they are receptive. They have come. They have asked. And as surprised as John is, his response is to tell them what they need to know. That is what they have to do. And that is simply, or as you said, Matt, or I would say maybe not so simply, to do the right thing. To bear fruit of righteousness, yeah, and and then and then the way that Luke records this, just so we get the note of who these people are in this context, even the tax collectors have an opinion here. Came to be baptized and asked them, "What shall we do?" 
And if you highlight it on Christ the King Sunday, Jesus's response to Pilate of who he is, then it draws for us to recognize what we do the, that bears fruits of evidence of the righteousness of God should in and of itself be a testimony to who Jesus is. Yeah, and and that's that's key for me here in that we are in these verses going back to the introduction of John from last week, who is proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we talked last week too about repentance as this change of perspective or a uh, change of a change of how one how one sees and and. And and so here, bearing fruits worthy of repentance, you know, another translation of that term worthy could be bearing fruits corresponding to that repentance. Yes, yes, yes. I find that to be really helpful yes. because, okay, so now this, you have this change of perspective, right? You, you're this, uh, this, uh, potentially this capacity to see what God is up to uh, now in Jesus. So what? what fruits are going to correspond to that changed reality, uh, that difference in perspective. And that might help people to say it's, um, cause I think people would sometimes get hung up on the term worthy and that might be a helpful translation for people to correspond. What is that correspondence that, yes. of, of between repentance and the, and the fruit that you're bearing? Troy Trofgruben, who wrote the commentary, uh, sees the same humor that I see in this um, unintended humor where, you know, verse 17, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And then verse 18, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. And something kind of like, was that just good news? Uh, you know, there's something like, wow, what's the bad news then? <laughs> I like, uh, but what that does is it gives a preacher a chance to say, why are we so preconditioned to see language of what Jesus is going to get rid of as awful news or as threatening or as somehow, you know, trauma inducing? And some of that has to do with, with other texts and some of that has to do with how people have been preached to in the past. But I would invite a preacher to think about what's some of the chaff that people can't wait to see gotten rid of? Not who, but what, you know? And so is this addiction, right? Is this, uh, is this fetal alcohol syndrome? Is this gun violence? I mean, what are the things that, like, I can't wait for that to be gone. And let's see what well-being looks like. He's already promised, or John's already starting to open the door to soldiers and tax collectors no longer fleecing us because they're taking advantage of their power. Like what else is going to go? So before we, we, we think like, am I wheat? Am I chaff? And, mm -hmm. and make those distinctions. Let's talk about what does it mean to yearn for a remade world where the harmful things are gone? And to me, that's, it makes it, it makes it very much good news. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really important. Another piece of this, and this uh, this circles back to um, this pointing to Jesus, um, when um, uh, the folks began to get excited and encouraged by this, they began to think, oh, this must be the Messiah. J John must be the one. And John is very clear to continually to point beyond himself that he is proclaiming the good news of Jesus as the Christ. And it's interesting that Herod was so offended by John calling out his sin that he would, in the next move, put John in prison. But John wasn't in prison for proclaiming Christ. Herod was distracted by his desire to remain in the circumstances that he thought him brought, brought him power and privilege and prestige and pleasure, um, that he missed that John was actually pointing to a new king. Now, for the sitting king, that probably should have been what was more disruptive. And instead, it was the loss of his power and his privilege and his pleasure. And the key thing for us always to remember is that 
when we are bearing fruits that are worthy of repentance, that we have to hear that this is not about us, that ultimately we are to be the witness to Jesus as the King. For me, actually, one of the one of the things that I thought about with the Isaiah, the psalm for this week, yes, Isaiah 12, 2 through 6, as, uh, as the commentary um, Brennan Breed talks about Isaiah 12, 1 through 6, invites us to pause and reflect on a deeper joy that comes from the most miraculous and awe-inspiring present ever given, the joy of divine salvation. And so one of the answers to what what does it mean to bear fruit or what is it that we should do is to sing, (laughs) right? Is to praise God. Surely, I mean, what difference would it mean to say or what would it feel like to say or to sing or to give witness or testimony as you were just saying, Joy, surely God is my salvation, Right. And just the power of naming that out loud of that affirmation and then hearing others say that Mm -hmm. uh, I will trust and will not be afraid for the Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. And so that could be an invitation. What you know, what shall I do? Well, why don't you start with praising God for that? (laughs) Um, in in all joy and gratitude, and then see where that leads you. But that's a worthy, that's a corresponding response as well, because mm-hmm. you're naming what you what you are seeing or trying to see. I love that. Uh, I did a similar kind of thing um, with this reading and asked the question: uh, Could these words be the response of those listeners to John? You know. You know, so that it it becomes that they 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 don't yet recognize that John isn't the Messiah, but they are at least beginning to make this chorus of shouts of praise and acclamations of joy. I like that. I like reading reading it in their mouth like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's the third Sunday of Advent, so it is Pink Candle Day. Yes. Joy. Yeah, or rejoicing. Yeah, got to taste Sunday. So you've got. Three texts here with Zephaniah, Isaiah, and Philippians that all really uh, underscore that. And uh, you called out uh, Brennan Breed's commentary, Caroline, which I think is really helpful showing where this fits in Isaiah, but even more so this idea of how the presence of God is indeed salvation itself. And that's, again, John encapsulates both the danger of that and the truth of that Mm. all, all wrapped up into one. Well, and then, I mean, Zephaniah, I actually, you know, Zephaniah and uh, Philipp- the Philippians text, I mean, we can take them separately, but just to know that you have this theme of rejoicing, right, in all of the texts. And so it might be, it also might be one of those sermons, egads, I can't believe I'm saying this, but uh, that that you are pulling from all of these texts to say uh, that, you know, bearing fruit is the first Bearing fruit is first to praise uh, yes. and to rejoice, yes. uh, which of course is which looks forward then to uh, to next week with the Magnificat, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and then also the the response of the angels on Christmas morning. So that's the that's the called for response to what God has done uh, in 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 Luke particularly is to rejoice and praise and then to ask to, you know, to what holds us back from doing that? Is that part of the chaff? I don't know, (laughs) but what prevents us from rejoicing and giving and, and singing for joy? What is it fear? Is it what's, yeah, what's holding us back? I think that's worth some homiletical thought as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That where is that reluctance? Where is that resistance to join with the angels? And I, and I just want to, I want to highlight that the joy, the uh, gratitude, the um, uh, exaltation is for who Jesus is. It is for who God is. 
in um, the, the the pointing, you know, even if we go back to Luke, the pointing of those who uh, were willing to bear the fruits uh, uh, corresponding to repentance was to say, oh, is this the one? So it didn't get caught up in what they had just experienced. It got caught up in, oh, God has promised the Messiah. Is this the Messiah? And each of these texts is actually making that as the place of joy. The place of joy is Jesus. It is rejoicing in what God is doing. Um, uh, it, it is rejoicing as it is in Philippians, always in the Lord. Um, why, as it says in Philippians, because the Lord is present, or as it specifically says, the Lord is new, near, near. And it, I don't have to worry. Uh, I don't have to doubt. I can be encouraged. I can act in a way that uh, reflects God has come. And that's what this season uh, is inviting us to move into. Yes? Yes. I was uh, I was preparing for this. I was having a hard time finding Zephaniah, and then somebody told me it was near Habakkuk, and that didn't help much either. But <laughs> but I found it. Uh, I'm struck by all the promises in here, all of these things about what the Lord uh, will do, who the Lord is, and and that strikes me as also really fitting for the season, um, in terms of talking about not just these specific promises which are certainly worthy of a sermon or fitting with a sermon, corresponding to a sermon, but are also um, just a great way of thinking about how faith is trust in promise, among other things. And and what does that look like? John offers promises, whether or not they come true, as John says or not, is an interesting um, interpretive question. But that so much of this season asks us to believe promises that are yet to be fully realized. To be realized. And what makes it easy to do that, hard to do that? What makes that the only option we have sometimes? And I, I, too, that a couple of turns of phrase here in this passage could tie into the resistances to joy or, or inability to praise, that I will change their shame into praise. I mean, is there something about, there's just something, a sense of unworthiness or shame that prevents us from that? Uh, or, and then I, for, I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. So there's this also God's response, God's, God's response to our praise is to, is to praise us, right. To lift us up, to rejoice in that, in that, uh, in that mutual rejoicing or mutual praise. Um, so the lot, a lot you could do with the Zephaniah text to get at some of the realities of, of the human condition that holds us back. When we describe the human condition as fallen, and that's some of our theological jargon we use, creation fall, um, we were created to bear the image of God. We stepped out of that narrative. God is continually um, turning us back to that. And that's exactly what you read here, as you just lifted up, Caroline, is that when we exalt God as God is due, then God restores the glory God has given in us. And so that glory is not going to be something we can achieve by trying to make a name for ourselves. But it is the glory that God bestows on us when we honor God as God is due. Philippians. More rejoicing. Rejoice. Yes. More rejoicing. And again. Again, I say rejoice. Remember that? It was like a I round. Do. Rejoice mm -hmm. in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Come on. Rejoice. Clap, clap. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Clap, clap. Rejoice. I lost my voice and I can't do this. <laughs> I want to so right. bad. So that's your song of the day. Yes. That's the end of the day. Do it as a round. Everybody will be happy. Yes. That's great. All right. There you have it. <laughs> and the people uh, and the peace of God. This is this is one of my favorite texts because in the midst, you know, in the midst of the realities that we live in, as we are being attentive to where folks are, even in this wonderful season of Advent, as we move toward this season of celebration. 
the reality is that for us to live in this rejoicing mode is countercultural. It just doesn't make sense. And that is the good news of having the mind of Christ. Passages like this, you know, uh, I'm I'm trained to suddenly start talking about literary context and what the Philippians were going through and what Paul was going through and how this pulls together themes in the letter. And then I just stop and I just read verses six and seven again. And then just, and as I talk to people in congregations over and over again, sometimes it's just, I I can just pull one sentence out of a given service and that's going to get me through the week. And uh, there are two of them that can do that. So how a preacher also avoids over complexifying things and just sometimes says, if there's nothing else you hear today, I want you to hear verse seven. And that will get you through the week as a kind of maybe mantra is the bad word, or not a, maybe as mantra is the wrong word to use, but, but maybe not, maybe just kind of this reminder. And again, Meditate we live by promises. Yeah. yeah. I should make it one of my mantra bracelets. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, and the in the same vein, Matt, and I appreciated the commentary pointing this out of the the of the claim in verse five, the Lord is near. And when we think of that that near, uh, uh, the commentator points out as both time and uh, and place, temporarily near or spatially near. And I wonder, too, how many people do not sense that or do not fear or do not feel that nearness of God, the nearness of the Lord, that they, for various and sundry reasons in their lives, all they know is the absence or the far awayness. And so what, what difference would it make, like to say a mantra for this week, the Lord is near, the Lord is near, the Lord is near. And isn't that also, too, one of the most beautiful gifts and and proclamations of Advent? And when you say that in the context that you brought up, Matt, that what is the circumstance of the Philippians when these words are being, this is not just a nice phrase to get me through a difficult week. This is written in the moment when people really were experiencing the chaos, the confusion that I am feeling, and they were able to hold to this mantra, as we're calling it, and it became so real in their life that they passed it on, that we were able to recite it and meditate it on in our times of longing. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.